good Sunday morning and happy Mother's Day to everyone. Uh, we're so glad you joined us this morning. Uh, we uh, are looking forward to nearing the end of the time where we're only doing live stream. We can't wait to have everyone back in church on the 24th. That's two weeks from today. Uh, we'll have more information on that uh, in the next week or so. Um, but I did want to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day, uh, a special happy Mother's Day um, to Sister Muck, who is kind of the mother of this church and is my surrogate mother for the last 20 years. Um, so I, I uh, wish her a happy Mother's Day. I miss you, and I can't wait to see all of you in two weeks. Amen. Uh, we want to pray and ask God to be with us this morning. Uh, and bless our service. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you this morning. We thank you for this time together, this time in your house. Lord, we ask that you'd anoint the word of God this morning. Lord, uh, let your power and anointing go from this place to the ears of everyone who hears this message. Lord, let us be transformed by the word and by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank your, uh, uh, take your attention this morning. To uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 this morning and verse number 3, and it goes like this uh, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers day and night, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I want to talk to you for a little bit today on this subject. Don't stop believing. Now, all you kids out there, um, when I was in high school, um, in 1983, the album Escape came out by Journey, and it was one of the biggest songs ever recorded, and Kathy's like getting all excited because I'm like in her wheelhouse this morning. Um, but, uh, so, uh, today though, since it's Mother's Day, I think I'm legally required to talk uh, directly to moms, and uh, I love my mom and uh, the great women I mentioned, Sister Mott, Sister Jewel down in Nelsonville, uh, who have been like moms to me. Um, so preaching a Mother's Day message is kind of a slam dunk. It's like Easter or Christmas. You just kind of know where to go. Now, for me, I haven't had my mom uh, for the last 20 Mother's Days, and so that's a little bit rough. I miss her. Um, you know, uh, my, my dear friend, uh, uh, Bishop Norman Hadley said, he said, uh, he said, you'll never stop missing them, but the pain will last uh, I think that's proven to be true. Uh, but I'm very thankful, not just for my mom, but the mom surrogates who are in my life. And uh, something that's said, and it certainly is true, is, you know, you don't have to give birth to someone to be their mom. Right? Moms are more... Than, than people who give birth. Uh, there are people who are natural moms. There are people who just take that role. I love in our church, um, in Sunday school, they all run to the back for Sister Man, who becomes a mom to all those kids back there. Um, and uh, now she's the mom to some of the kids that she had before that, that had their own kids. So she's the mom slash grandmom of <laughs> some of those kids. Um, but, uh, as I think about moms in the Bible, of course, uh, you know, the probably the most famous mom in the Bible was Mary, the mother of Jesus. And, uh, you know, she was a huge hit, massive hit, right? I went to college at Notre Dame College in Cleveland, which literally in Latin means Our Lady. So, you know, I know about uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so I went to Catholic college, and, uh, and when you go... Through Catholic education, you learn about Mary. So I have that down pat. Now, so I'm not going to talk about Mary today. Kathy's all sad because I was right in her wheelhouse. Um, so I'm not going to talk about Mary.
marry you today. We're going to talk about another very effective mob. Uh, because sometimes uh, the brightest stars uh, aren't the only ones that give off light. And uh, God wants you to be great for him right where you are. And God will work things out even if you don't see it. Right, so I want to go to Genesis chapter 13 this morning, uh, and verse 2 says, uh, Now there was a man from Zorah uh, of the family of the Danites, whose name was uh, uh, Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said, Indeed now you are barren, and you have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, interestingly enough, this woman is never named in the Bible. They never give us this woman's name. Now, the husband's name is Manoah. If you're like me and you've been uh, put, put up in quarantine and you're watching a little streaming uh, Disney Plus, uh, you're going to start calling his name Moana, which is completely different. You know, so all I can think about is him singing, you're welcome. But that's not who this was. This was Manoah and not Moana. Um, but the woman isn't even named. The Bible never says that's her name. But she's barren and she doesn't have any children. And we talked about a few weeks ago that your children were your social security system, right? That was the way you provided for yourself in your old age, was that your kids would take care of you. And uh, even though she was married, uh, women, uh, according to the life chart, tend to live longer than men, and she would have no one to take care of her because she didn't have any kids. And the angel tells her, you're going to have a son. And the, that is, the fact that it's going to be a son is important because at the time, the sons are the worker bees, and they support the parents in their old age. So here's what she does. She runs, and in verse 6, she tells her husband. It says, so the woman came and told her husband, said, the man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I love that term, very awesome. Um, but I did not ask him where he was from, and he didn't tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, uh, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb uh, to the day of his death. The woman not only told her she was going to have a son, but she said, this son that you're going to have is ordained to do a special work for God. Um, he, his job is going to be to deliver the Israelites out of the hands of the Philistines. Um, and I thought that was interesting because we plan for everything for our kids. We plan their bedrooms. We plan uh, what, what, when, when our kids, before they were born, we planned what outfits we were going to bring them home in. And we had a dress for our son. Uh, we didn't know he was going to be a boy at that time. Uh, and so my mom had to run out and go, go buy boy clothes because we had the cutest little Ohio State jumper to bring him in. And, uh, and you know, whatever clothes you go, man. But um, so um, but we planned on that. What, you know, what school they're going to go to. People talking about preschool with kids who are in their infancy, and, and, uh, and we plan all of that, but when you're doing all that, don't leave God out of the plan. Don't leave God out. Remember, we talked about Job uh, last week, where Job uh, uh, included his kids in everything he did. He prayed for them, and he instructed them in the ways of God. And so this is more important than really anything else we do for our kids, is to include God in their plan. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. My, my pastor always used to say, you raise chickens, but you train children. So you train your child. And a child, when it's left alone, will not default to being its best self. I got three kids. I have seen this movie before. If you leave your kids and go, be good, they're not going to be good. Charity and I have gone to across the ocean six time zones away, and our children have chosen to have disagreements and decided to call us at 10 o'clock at night, Eastern Standard Time. Now, that's great, except that that's 4 a.m. Central European 
time. And so when I get arisen from a deep sleep, having a discussion about should we stop with McDonald's or Burger King, I want to fly back home on my own team and kill children. I said all that to say this. Children will not default to their best self when left on their own. That's why we've got to train them. That's why we have to encourage them to live for God. That's why we've got to train them in the ways of God. And so, Samson's mother wants this. <coughs> in Judges chapter uh, 13, verse 8, Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, uh, please let the man of God who you said come again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. So the man follows his wife's lead. Always a good move. Always a good move. Always a good move. Get a, get an amen. amen. There it is. The man follows his wife's lead and prays that God will send someone to help them and teach them how to raise their child for God. And that's the whole reason we have church, right? To, uh, God sends people to help you raise and train your children. Now, let me speak as a pastor for a moment. It's on you to train your kids in the ways of God. It's not on the Sunday school teacher, it's not on the pastor, it's not on the church. Those are all there to help and guide and assist. But it's on you. Here's what. What goes on in your home will far supersede what is preached over this pulpit. They have to see it lived at home. The church, the pastor, the Sunday school teachers are all here to help. But at home is where they will learn to follow God. At home is where they will be trained in the ways of God. So that will happen at home. Uh, and that's what Manoah and his wife prayed for. They said, send a man and have him teach us and train us how we're supposed to raise uh, this son who has this special uh, plan from God. Judges chapter 13 and verse 9. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came to the woman again, and she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. The woman ran in haste and tore her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. So Manoah rose and followed his wife. Uh, when she came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? He said, I am. Mom and dad wanted their child to be brought up in the way of God. They had to be intentional about it. I have had teachers in my <coughs> excuse me, I had teachers in my life tell me, um, if you're going to do something, you need to be intentional about it. Great things don't happen by accident. When we planted this church, we were very intentional about it. We didn't just go, you know what, wouldn't it be a good thing to plant a church in Johnstown? Maybe we'll go out services next week. We were intentional about it. We planned to do it. We made a plan and we followed that plan. We did research and we prayed and fasted and and were intentional that we wanted to go to Johnstown and raise up a church for Jesus Christ. And so Manoah and his wife don't suppose that God would make their kid turn out okay, right? They assume that they're going to need to be trained on how to do this. They were intentional. And they sought out the man, and she sought out her husband. Don't leave anything to chance. You must be intentional. James chapter 1 verse 12 says this, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, King James verse says pride, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man who endures. He faces resistance, and yet he persists in going forward. Why? Because he is intentional in his purpose. He wants to finish strong, so he endures because he knows whatever he's going through, there's a crown of life at the end of it. And so he's intentional. He says, problems come up that I didn't see, and situations come up that I didn't plan on dealing with, and people come in and out of my life, and some people who I thought loved me hurt me, 
And then rather than drop it out, he's intentional about living for God. Why? Because he knows there's a reward at the end. Mom and dad, if kids are to receive uh, their reward promised to them, then you must be intentional about making sure the word of God is preeminent in your home, and making sure that they're in church, and making sure that they live for God. Verse 12 to Genesis 13, Manoah said, Now let, the, let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I've said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said, Okay, I'm going to be intentional about this. How do I get from A to B? you got to have a plan. He says, how do we make sure that the boy fulfills the purpose that God had for his life? Now, I want you to hear me from our pastor here for a moment. The angel says to mom, you need to mirror the behavior he's going to need to follow in his life. His example is going to be you. When the angel first comes, in the beginning of this chapter, I'm going to just read it to you, Judges chapter 12 and verse 3. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said, Indeed, you are barren and born no children, but you are going to conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, uh, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. She said, the angel of the Lord says to the woman, you're going to have a son. And God has great plans for him. I will tell you today, if you have children in your home, God has great plans for them. Some of y'all have grandchildren in your home, and God has great plans for them. So the angel says to the woman, then she's going to begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. God's got a purpose and God's got a plan for him. But it's not going to happen without preparation. It's not going to happen without being intentional. And so he says, don't drink wine or strong drink because he's going to be a Nazarite. Not a Nazarene, that's something different. A Nazarite. He said, what's a Nazarite? Glad you asked. Numbers chapter 6. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of the Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine or similar drinks. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drinks. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. For all the days of his separation, he uh, shall eat nothing that is produced from the grapevine, grapevine from seed to skin. The Lord said to Moses, if someone's going to take a vow of a Nazarite, that vow is a vow of separating. I'm going to separate myself to God. And it's an offering, the Bible says. I'm going to consecrate myself. I'm going to separate myself so that I can get closer to God. You did some things that showed you were different and that you had dedicated your life to God. That's what that offering was all about. That's what that vow was all about. Is you said, I'm going to separate myself, and some of the things I'm going to do may look a little extreme and may look a little crazy, but you've got to understand there's a higher purpose in that. I am separating myself and making a vow to God. I am consecrating myself to God. And so I'm going to do things that even uh, though they make me lawful, I'm going to withdraw them from myself because I want to be closer to God. And so in this natural vow, number tells us there's no wine or strong drink, no vinegar from wine, no grape juice, no grape or raisins. That seems really extreme to me, right? People who are intentional about getting close to God and living for God, realize that they may need to do things that don't seem to make a lot of sense. But they do it because to do so will cause them 
to get closer to God and set things aside. When the year began here at Crossroads, we went on fast. We, uh, we took some things out of our life. We took media out of our life. Or we took some sort of food out of our life. And uh, somebody looking on the outside would go, well, this doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, to those who did it, said, I am removing these things from my life to, to cut out the noise so that I can hear God. I'm making a vow to God. And I am pulling some things out of my life. Not because they're necessarily wrong, but because I want to be consecrated to God. I don't want to stand uh, so close to the end. Your question should never be, what can I get away with and still get to heaven? Right? The question is, what do I need to do to get as close to God as I humanly can? Because if we're in love with God, we're not going to see how far we can get away from God and still stay in relationship with Him. Right? That would be me. And this is hypothetical. I want this on tape. This would be hypothetically me going, So, Chair, how far could I go with another woman and we'd still be married? <laughs> it's all hypothetical. That's what's saved for eternity. This is called evidence, all right? But I'm just saying... That question, now, the smattering of people who are here are laughing. Because Jerry's answer is, not at all. Am I right? Can I get an amen from the back corner? <clears throat> there it is. But sometimes our thinking is, how far away from God and close to the world can we get and still be in relationship with God? And what the natural right vow was, was to say, I'm going to cut things out of my life that are legal, that I can do that are not sin. But if I put these aside, it will show that I am consecrating myself towards God. And I'm not seeing how far I can get away, but I'm seeing how close I can get to God. And that was the purpose of it. No wine, no strong drink, vinegar, grape juice, grapes, raisins. And so it was, on the surface, crazy extreme. And then Steve Jobs would say, but wait, there's more. Verse 5, all the days of the vow of the separation, no razor shall come upon his head. Until the days are fulfilled for which he has separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. And he shall let the locks of his hair grow. All the days he separates himself from the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. Now pay attention to this. He shall not make himself unclean, even to his father, or his mother, or his brother, or his sister, when they die. Because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation shall be holy unto the Lord. Now, it's the first thing he says, he can't cut his hair. Some of y'all are looking like Nazarites right now. Right? Some of y'all are taking that vow real seriously. Getting real fishy out there, but he couldn't cut his hair. Now, here's the other thing. He couldn't touch a dead body, even if it was the mom or dad or brother or sister. Why? Because if you were going to be intentional about getting close to God, there's going to be sacrifice involved. And there will be times where you go, well, well, my family doesn't get it. If I'm prepared to get close to God, there are things even my family don't understand that I'm going to get close to God anyway. And again, it may seem extreme, but I'm willing to do some extreme things if I can have the closest relationship to God that I can have. Samson's mom was required to live like a Nazarite because Samson was going to be a Nazarite. Children are going to model what they see at home, not what they see at the church. Not what they see at the church. Children are going to look at home and go, this is what is normal. This is what it means to live for God. If you say I'm a Christian, and when you get home, your life doesn't reflect that I'm a Christian, they're not going to believe it. Paul writes to Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 17, he says, Brother, join in following my example and note to those who so walk, so you have a pattern. Uh, so you have us for a pattern. Paul says to Philippians, find an example of someone walking with God and follow them. The easy 
that example should be mom and dad. That's where that example should be. Here's what Paul told the Corinthians, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. He said, those of you on Sunday who've been watching the Michael Jordan documentary on ESPN, uh, they showed that commercial, that Gary commercial that was in the 80s and 90s, like Mike, if I can be like Mike, right? Old generation want to be like Michael Jordan, and you ain't that good. Uh, but you know, everybody wanted to be like Mike. But Paul's saying, I want to be like Jesus. And so I'm going to act like Jesus. Uh, they talk about the number of, they expected the Air Jordan 1 to sell uh, between 3 and $4 million worth of shoes by the end of his contract. And in the first year of his contract, they sold $125 million worth of Air Jordan 1. Why? Because people wanted to be like Mike. I'll tell you this, I want to be like Jesus. And so Paul tells the Corinthians, you imitate me as I imitate Jesus. Samson's mom was to be an example. She said, here's what a Nazarite supposed to be. I'm going to present an example for you to follow so you'll understand exactly what you're supposed to do. Now before the angel leaves, they make a sacrifice. Judges 13 and 19. So Manoah took the young goat and a grain offering and offered it on the rock of the Lord. And he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. As it happened, as the flame went up towards heaven the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And when Manoah and his wife saw it, they fell on their faces on the ground. And when the angel appeared to the Lord, appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. They make this offering on a rock. And the angel touches his stick, his staff on the rock. And everything goes up in flames, including the angel. That is a great threat. And Manoah, the Bible says, he knew that it was the angel of the Lord in verse 21. Now, mom knew it was the angel of the Lord in verse 3. Follow that woman who gets it. But we have two examples here for Samson's upbringing, right? Samson is going to do a great thing. He's going to begin to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. But there's an example here. There's an example of sacrifice. Your kids are going to learn to live for God by watching how you live and how you give. Your living and your giving are what's going to determine what your kids think are important. What you say will evaporate as fast as those words do. But what you model in your life, how you live, how you sacrifice, how you give, or what your kids are going to see. I love this next couple verses. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. He said, God's going to kill us now. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted our burnt offering and grave offering and grain offering from our hands. And he wouldn't have shown us all these things, nor would he have told us what to do. Manoah, we're all going to die. His wife, if God's going to kill us, we're already be dead. Brethren, thank God for a woman in your life who stabilizes your mood. I'm telling you. We have a agreement in our house. None of us, can, neither Jeremy nor I, can be psychotic at the same time. You know, one of you has got to be the steady ship on the sea, and one of you has got to be the sea. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can only have one crazy person at a time, and normally I'm the crazy person. <laughs> I thank God for women who are stabilizers for husbands. But he said, we've got a plan now. Told us what to do. That's what the wife said. She said, God wouldn't have accepted our offering. And more importantly, God wouldn't have told us what to do. God wouldn't have told us these are the things you need to do so that this child, this boy Samson, can fulfill his purpose before God. Let's go back to Proverbs. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, if you read the next three chapters of Judges, you'll see that Samson uh, intermingles his life with tremendous victories and appalling defeats. 
the story of Samson in the book of Judges, 13, 14, 15, 16, uh, are just a, a, a roller coaster ride of somebody who does great things, right? He marries a prostitute, not so good, kills a thousand Philistines, awesome, violates his vow, not so good, tears down the gates of an enemy city, right? Now he's rolling. And so he's a real mixed bag of things. And then finally he meets up with Delilah. He gives Delilah his secret after a few false starts. They shave his head. The Philistines capture him. They, uh, they uh, put out his eyes and they put him to work, grinding at the mill. He violated his vow and let her shave his head. And he becomes a servant of the Philistines. Nowhere in Scripture do we see that Samson's mom didn't live up to the deal. Nowhere in Scripture, quite the contrary actually, do we see that Samson's mom didn't do everything she was supposed to do so that that kid would turn out well. And he was filled with so much promise. And he went off. I want to offer you moms this Sunday this word. You may have raised your kid right. You may have trained them up in the way of the Lord. And at some point they just went off the rails. I did everything I knew to do. I kept them in church. We modeled Christ in our home. We did everything we were supposed to do. And the kids still went off the rails. They're not living for God. They, they've made a mess in their life. They've done things I can't even imagine. Don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. Train up a child. And what's the Bible say? And when he is old, there may be a lot of stuff happening in that in between. From the time they leave your house to when they're old. But the Bible tells me, and this is what I put my faith in, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Judges chapter 16 and verse 28. Then Samson cried to the Lord, saying, O oh God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines. For much love. Samson turned back to God. Remember me one more time. And the Bible tells us in Judges chapter 16 that he kills more Philistines in his death than he ever killed in his life. But that's kind of a bittersweet thing because he's still dead. He's killed all these Philistines, but you feel like he didn't live out to his potential, you know? I felt that way for years until this portion of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also David and Samuel and the prophets. Samson is mentioned in this hero's hall of faith in the same breath and in the same birth as David. That doesn't seem right. And yet the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11 puts him in the same class as Moses and Noah and Abraham. Mom, on this Mother's Day, if that kid of yours and you, you cry and you pray and you say, God, I don't understand where my kid went sideways. Don't stop believing. God still got a plan. God still working. Those prayers you pray are still reaching up to heaven and are still working in their life. God is working. And it's His will to do this. Even, I love this song, even when I don't see Him, He's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. I can look at situations and go, I don't see God in this at all. I 
did everything I was supposed to do. What happened? You know what? I don't see it. He's working. Timothy, all right, Timothy, I thank God who I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers said, and, and without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers day and night, greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to my remembrance the genuine faith that's in you, which first dwell in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God that's in you. Paul said, I watched your grandmother Lois model this. And I watched your mother Eunice model this. You've seen it. You know how it's supposed to be done. Paul said, I put my own hands on you and prayed for you. Now it's time for you to stir up that gift that's been given. Mom and Dad, uh, I'm telling you on this Mother's Day, uh, I'm praying that God will stir up the gift of so many kids who have been had it modeled and been prayed for and had their lives dedicated to God and somewhere have lost their way. Don't stop believing. Paul tells Timothy, I saw it. I saw it modeled and I saw them lived it. And they were your example. Now follow that. And stir up the gift that's inside of you. Don't stop believing because God is faithful. To the kids, you watch your mom and your grandma live and be an example. You watch the church mothers who live their lives for you. I thank God for church mothers. People like Sister Monk, who will take a whole church and say, I'm going to be a mother to this church. Now stir that gift up in you. Stir it up in you. Last verse. Paul finishes this chapter to Timothy. He says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. What well, Paul's saying, he goes, I know I serve a God. I know who I believe in. I am persuaded. I have believed it with everything in me that God is going to do what he said he would do. The Bible tells me if I train up a child. The Bible tells me if I'm an example and you're to follow me as I follow Christ. If I commit all that to God and I have faith that God will continue to work even if I don't see it, even if I don't understand it, even if it seems that all hope is lost. Paul said, I'm persuaded that if I put it in his hand, he's going to take care of it. I am persuaded. Timothy, I am persuaded that what was in your mom and what was in your grandma and what is in you, God, is going to bring to fruition. Sweet mothers who are watching this today, your kids may have gone a little sideways. They may not live for God. They may be questioning things. You may go, I don't know where things went wrong. I'm telling you right now, don't stop believing. If you put it in God's hand, let God do the work that God said he would do. If you train up the child, let God do that work. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of your spirit. Lord, I pray right now to every mother who is watching here who wonders what has happened to their child or their grandchild. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give them hope, give them peace, Lord, and restore unto them that which they put into your hands. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. To all the moms and grandmoms and all the sweet ladies, happy Mother's Day. I love every one of you. And ain't nothing you can do about it. I will see you in two weeks. God bless you. Have a great day. Call your mom if she's still alive. If she's not still alive, call someone like a mom. Since your mom, call you later today. I love you.